Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Daniela Zarcone, and I'm the vice president of Psi Beta. Tonight, we have the pleasure of having Michelle Lacey present about postpartum mental health issues. Michelle received her master's degree from the University of Arizona in rehabilitation counseling. She has been serving women and families since 1995 in both nonprofit and private practice. She has extensive training in treating trauma and is EMDM tra EMDR excuse me, trained. Michelle is a licensed professional counselor and certified perinatal mental health clinician. She is a founding member and executive director of Women's Health Innovations of Arizona. Women's Health Innovation of Arizona is a licensed out outpatient treatment center specializing in mental health needs surrounding pregnancy, postpartum, and parenting. She serves on the Arizona Department of Health Services Maternal Mental Health Task Force, Maternal Mental Health Advisory Committee, and Maternal Health Steering Committee. Michelle has been a member of Postpartum Support International since 2002 and serves as a state coordinator, national trainer, and subject matter expert. Michelle also serves as board president for Postpartum Support International's Arizona chapter. One in seven women will suffer from postpartum depression and their partners will suffer too. This is a very important topic that affects so many women and it's something that we just don't talk enough about. To spread awareness about this issue, without further ado, Michelle Lacey. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, I love to come and speak to whether it's a small moms group, to a large auditorium of people, whoever will listen, because maternal mental health and perinatal mood and anxiety disorders are so underdiagnosed, undertreated, misunderstood. And so my job and my passion has been to help educate, but also um, provide best practice care for parents um, around this time period. Women's Health Innovations of Arizona is an uh, outpatient treat, licensed outpatient treatment center. We're a nonprofit. We have two sides of our program. Um, we have our philanthropic side. We have our insurance-based and, um, and fee-for-service side because we really believe that we should, we, we want to improve access to care. We believe that all families should have access to specialized care and maternal mental health. And we want to provide the best practices uh, that are around this, around this topic, which is not done a lot. There's not a lot of us out there. So let's talk a little bit about mental health and pregnancy. Previously, people, you would think that pregnancy would protect the mood. But what we tend to see is that we see perinatal mood and anxiety disorders happening about the same amount as, as we do in, in the postpartum. So it's estimated about 20% of uh, pregnant people will experience moderate to severe depression or anxiety. A lot of times it's not recognized and it, it's often minimized and, and discounted as, oh, it's your hormones, you're just, you'll be fine, you're pregnant, that's just how it, ha how it is. But really, you can actually have a true mood disorder during pregnancy. We call it perinatal because mood struggles can happen anytime in the pregnancy and anytime during that first year postpartum. We also know that weaning from breastfeeding can trigger a mood struggle. We know that the untreated illness can last, can become a chronic mental health struggle. We also know that it can last up to three years if it doesn't get the right kind of care. This has detrimental effects on the entire family system. So perinatal mood and anxiety disorders are not just a woman's issue, not a father's issue. It's a family issue. It's a community issue, and we believe it's a public health issue, which is why I sit on all of those different task force and steering committees, because I need, we need to have a voice out there that says, hey, we have to address this. This is the number one complication of pregnancy. It's not gestational diabetes. It's not high blood pressure. It's not, pre, um, it's not placenta previa. It's perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, number one complication in pregnancy. And you heard one to seven. Sometimes we hear we say one to one in five moms will experience it. But we also know that one in ten dads will experience moderate to severe depression and anxiety. 
So why do we have such a difference in that one to five or one to seven? Some of it is um, screening tools that are used, when people are screened, how, um, what the cutoff scores are with the screens. But in, in 2013, there was a landmark study um, that, lo that looked at just what, how did it present. And um, Wisner and her colleagues identified about 21% of women were diagnosed with postpartum depression. And from there, they broke it down and looked at what was the presentation. So we saw about 68.5% at the primary diagnosis of unipolar depression. 66% of those 21% had a major depressive disorder with comorbid anxiety, which we see a lot of. 22% was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. And almost 19% um, endorse thoughts of, of harming themselves. So we often hear about the tragedies on the news, and we think that that equals postpartum depression. And so one of the things I'm going to go over tonight is talk to you about what, how, what these mood disorders look like. Because it's not just the baby blues, and most people think that. But we really want to make sure that people have a clear understanding that there are lots of different things that can be presented in this period, and I hope that you leave here un under, have a better understanding of that. I do have to talk a little bit about how perinatal mood disorders were affected by COVID. We know that um, a global pandemic will, um, we will experience anxiety and depression be, as a result in the general population. But we know that families, parents, perinatal mental health was impacted significantly, and we saw that in, in clinic. So there was, a, there was a survey early on in the pandemic May, from May 21st, 2020 to August 17th, 2020. And it really looked at um, just what was happening for moms there. And what it showed us was one in three, about 36% were experiencing a perinatal mood and anxiety disorder. So the question was, well, was it the pandemic? Was it the unknowns? What was happening here? So we were kind of, we put that at the back of our, in the back of our mind. But then in 2021, there was a cross-national study um, in April. Um, there was about 7,000 people, almost 7,000 people involved in the study. And they, we completed measures. Um, they looked at the demographics, uh, COVID exp exposures and worries and beliefs about COVID, um, prevention behaviors, and then the mental health sy symptoms, including PTSD. We also, they also used some tools to assess um, mood and PTSD and then a loneliness scale because that's what we were hearing also clinically. And this is one of my favorite to sh show because if you look at the general population as a result of COVID, we see that there were heightened levels of um, anxiety and depression and PTSD. And then on the, the far end, or yeah, over here, but closest to me, if you look at the pre-COVID numbers of depression and anxiety and PTSD, we saw that the, you know, the, the, the depression up there. But what we have been seeing in post-COVID times or as a result of COVID is heightened levels of PTSD, um, what, and heightened levels of anxiety at levels we've never seen before. And there we go again, about one in three moms experiencing postpartum depression itself. The reason we see the, much of that PTSD, those PTSD symptoms, anxiety symptoms, obviously fears of public places, fears of exposure, unknowns, sense of lo loneliness and isolation, lots of grief and loss as a result of the pandemic when people were, we had a, a lockdown, um, parents, grandparents, people weren't coming to, to um, celebrate, we weren't having those normal traditions and rituals, uh, a lot of people were de delivering on their own um, or had limited visitors, parents who had children in the NICU could ha take to turns coming. One would come one day, they could not leave. If they left, they couldn't come back. And so there was a lot of restrictions on that. And um, you have to remember that trauma is in the eye of the beholder. And I will go on a little bit more about that later. The other thing that we have to consider is what happens to the body. So when we, get, we, we hear someone's pregnant, a lot of times what we hear is, oh, that's so wonderful, how exciting, aren't you so excited? And we have to remember that about 50% of all births go unplanned. That's just a large number. So not everyone is kicking up their heels that they're pregnant. 
Um, it's not all exciting. And a lot of times we have these myths of motherhood that this is gonna be this happy glowing time and I'm just gonna bond so much with this baby and then I'm gonna have the baby and it's gonna be this instant bond and I'm gonna absolutely know what to do and it's gonna be so great. And if that doesn't happen, what we do is we turn on ourselves. We shame ourselves. What's wrong with me? And we don't consider what's actually happening with the body and the system as a whole. So when we look, talk about the hormone drop and we joke and we say, oh yeah, oh, it's hormones, it's hormones. But the, the postpartum period, when you deliver the placenta, it has the largest single sudden heart, hormone drop than any other time in a person's life. Any other time. During pregnancy, um, your estrogen and progesterone increase to a level that's something like taking 100 birth control pills a day. And then day three, it's like going to taking none. So think about that for a moment. Those of you who've been around, you know, maybe not you, but maybe other people who've had um, shifts in their hormones, slight shifts in their hormones, and they're irritable. Think about what that kind of a drop in hormones will do to a mood. And if you have any predisposition or risk factors for mood struggles, that hormone drop is going to have a significant impact on you. So it's kind of like PMS on steroids, is one doctor said. The other thing that we have to consider is that this family system is like a baby's mobile. One piece of the mobile moves, the rest of the mobile is going to move, right? Well, you would insert a baby into this, this system, the whole system is gonna move. So not only are you having this hormone change, you're having a system change, a life change. But we're not thinking about that because most of the time we're thinking about well, how are we gonna deliver the baby? We focus on the birth and not the parenting piece of it. And what's normal to experience after you have a baby is grief because we miss our old lifestyle, we miss our body, we miss our freedom, we miss our sleep, and people feel shame again if they're grieving their own old lifestyle. But if you think about, say when you've changed a job, maybe if it was, even if it was a good job, it was maybe a promotion and you're excited about it, it's a change. And when you get into the new job, you're not really sure what you're doing, you're kind of unsure, you gotta learn some things, so you miss what was predictable. Well, it's the same thing in when we have a baby. We miss what we knew. And parenting does not come with a rule book or a how-to book. You can read every book out there and it will tell you something different. So now you have this psychosocial change, you have this hormonal change, and then you have the sleep deprivation. And so let me just tell you that we joke about new parents not sleeping, but um, it's not a joke because they torture prisoners of war by waking them up every two to three hours for days on end. So to give you perspective, trained military personnel will tell their country's secrets by being woken up every two to three hours. But for some reason, we think it's okay for a new parent. So now that's, that's you have the hormone drop, you got the psychosocial change, and you've got this sleep deprivation that all contributes to how I experience um, this time and this period. And if I'm vulnerable, then I might, I'm gonna, I might experience it very different than I thought or what I read about or what I see on social media. So a lot of people screen, and when we screen, you might, if any of you have had children, you, you know, in the hospital you screen, maybe your pediatrician screens, screening is a great opportunity. So anyone in this room that comes in contact or works with a pregnant or postpartum person, you can screen, because screening is not a diagnostic tool, but screening normalizes it. We screen urine, we screen blood pressure in pregnancy, why don't we screen the mood? Um, what's one of the things that some states mandate it, but not, we don't do that here. So there are a few different screening tools that we use. It's the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale. I love that one. It's validated. It's validated for teens, for pregnancy, for dads. It comes in 60 different languages, and it's free. 
So it's wonderful. The PHQ-9 has also been validated for the perinatal period as well. So I like to always go over the risk factors. And after I go over these many risk factors, you're all going to be like, well, wow. No wonder it's the number one complication of pregnancy, because look at all of that. So a family or personal history of um, previous perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. We know that a, one, a person who has had experience with a, a perinatal mood disorder, she's about 50% likely to experience it again. So we want to monitor her in pregnancy. Um, we want to ma monitor them um, throughout the postpartum period. If there's a family history, but the problem is, is a lot of people don't really talk about it because there's a lot of shame associated. Because it's as, it's as if if I struggle in my mood in pregnancy or postpartum, then that must mean I don't love my baby. And it absolutely has nothing to do with the baby. It has to do with what's going on with you, like any other time. We know that this is one of the most vulnerable times in a birthing person's life than any other time. So if they have a family history, a personal or family history of depression, anxiety, OCD, eating disorder, substance use disorders, bipolar disorder, any mental health diagnosis prior to pregnancy, that's a risk factor. Any history of childhood sexual abuse is a risk factor. Um, we know that um, during this vulnerable time, I can't tell you how much we process sexual trauma, previous sexual trauma in the postpartum period. Because our, all of, we hold our trauma in our body, and everything tends to come up to the surface. Any dis, um, abrupt dis, discontinuing of breastfeeding, think about that for a moment. If you stop breastfeeding abruptly, you're going to have another significant hormone shift, and that can affect the brain. Diabetes prior to pregnancy is a risk factor, or thyroid issues, or for anyone with fertility cha challenges. Fertility challenges come with a lot of stress and usually years of struggle and financial burden and grief and loss. And a lot of times that goes un unaddressed, right? Because what do we do as humans? We go through difficult times and we're like, we white knuckle through it and then we push it aside and then we power through. But that stays with us and, that, and then something can trigger it to bring it up to the surface. And the perinatal period is fertile ground for that. Any endocrine disorders? Social support is the number, one con uh, the number one protective factor. So if somebody doesn't have good, healthy social support, so think about what the, what the pandemic did, right? People were isolated. P parents were at home. Parents were educating their older kids. They weren't having the meal trains and all the other people coming. And that isolation really fueled the, 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 the experience of the mood. Any um, experience with interpersonal violence or other relationship stress is um, financial stressors. We know poverty, women in poverty, parents in poverty will ex are 50% likely to experience a perinatal mood and anxiety disorder. Like just take that in for one moment, 50%, which is one reason why we exist because prior to our work at WHI, um, if you had really good insurance or a lot of money, you could get good services or specialized care. And that's not acceptable. We believe that everybody should have access to specialized care. So we partner with a lot of different organizations so that we can serve as many people as possible. Any um, child care stressors? I am floored at the cost of child care. I have employees that talk, tell me about their child care prices. I, I don't, it's, it's unbelievable to me. So those are some stressors. Again, financial stressors. Um, recent loss or move. So think about the pandemic again. So many people lost so much. Their safety, friends, friendships were lost, right? Relationships were damaged. People took sides suddenly. Um, maybe, maybe they had loss of, um, through death, loss of health. So we have to, loss of an animal. We want to understand loss, the losses that a person experiences. And it's really important to understand the individual in front of you. So we always talk about, like, tell me about who you are. And we want to listen for those losses. Any barriers to care? Um, institutional racism. We know that black and brown um, parents 
uh, die more often than white parents and have more complications, are less heard than other people. And so we have to do something different with that as well. Climate stressors, we don't necessarily have that here in Arizona except for what we find in the summertime when people are locked in their house because it's too hot to go out. Um, they tend to feel, experience more depression. But when, in other areas where the sun goes down at four and there's lots of, there's lots of um, rain and snow and darkness, um, we can ex if they have that in there, that's a risk factor. And some people, again, their lack of sleep is a, one, a big one. Physical pain and inflammation. We don't think about that with um, having a new baby. We think, oh, well, you, I mean, people have been having babies for millions of years. What's the problem? But when we have pain, we know that that will increase a person's risk. I worked with a woman once who was, um, came to me, and she had, after she delivered her baby, she was diagnosed with a ligament disorder, and it caused great amount of pain. And she couldn't find the right provider at that time. It was a while ago. And um, as she continued on and on and on in her pain, her mood declined and declined and declined. And she was severely depressed. And she finally found a pelvic floor PT, which is really a birthing person's saving grace because it really helped her. And she became a new person. So we cannot... We cannot um, minimize the impact of pain. So think about it when you are, if whether you've had a vaginal birth or a cesarean birth, you're gonna have some pain. Um, as you're trying to nurse, if you choose to nurse, you're going to have some pain. Pain comes with it. We wanna check in on how is a person doing with that pain. Um, obviously we talked about um, unresolved grief and loss, um, intrauterine loss, neonatal death. Um, selective reduction or elective abortion. We also know that now with the changes in um, the laws that we will have a different experience. Um, I met with hospice this week for their pediatric program and we were sharing with me when there's life limiting um, experience, uh, a diagnosis for babies um, just in the last few weeks. They've del people have delivered babies that um, died at birth and that whole experience, because they couldn't um, do, a, have, they didn't have another choice um, but to deliver, and that whole experience of caring to, to the end and, and delivering a baby to die at birth was traumatizing to them. And for them, it was their choice that was taken from them, and now they were experiencing trauma. So it's gonna go both ways, right? So we have to really be able to understand the individual. What was it like for you? What, how did you experience that? Tell me how it was for you. Um, any estrangement or complications in relationship with the own mother? Here's the deal. It doesn't matter if you have a great relationship with your mother. When you have a baby, all the stuff is going to come to the surface. So you might have some mother issues. You might be really grateful for your mother, but if you might remember the things she did when you were 15, and then all of a sudden that's bothering you. Or she might be very um, well-meaning and say, hey, why don't you try? And that, for some reason, bothers you. Don't control me. You know, so it'll come up. And, and, and it's just part, again, of the systemic change that is occurring within the family. Any complications within the pregnancy, the birth, or breastfeeding. And what that means is things just didn't go the way I thought they would. So we always have to check expectations of the person because sometimes people have these really high expectations. I am going to go into labor naturally, and this is going to, and they have this like 55 page birth plan, and nothing goes the way they planned, and then it's, then it's a, um, it feels traumatic to them. Or complications like um, one person experienced where all of a sudden her baby's heart rates um, dropped really low, and all these people came out of nowhere and flipped her over and put, put oxygen on her and all of these things, and she, was, she had no idea what was going on. And that was traumatic to her, that, and that carried with her through the postpartum. Any health cha challenges for the baby and the parents? So we know that babies in the NICU, parents in the NICU, about 50, almost 50% of mothers will experience PTSD symptoms, and about a third of fathers will experience PTSD symptoms if they have babies in the NICU. The temperament of the baby. This is a tough one because um, 
you know, we're supposed to, oh, I love my baby at all costs, it's so great, right? But when you have a baby that's colicky, colicky and screams all the time, it's very normal and human to say, I can't stand this, I want to get away from it. And people are like, oh, don't say that. But if you have a baby screaming, 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 and keeping you up all night long, you're going to want to get away from it. So we know that that's a risk factor. So let's just, let's just embrace it and say, let's talk about it. Let's normalize it. Let's empathize with it. And then let's problem solve how we can get this parent some support and sleep and rest. But instead, we, t we send the message a lot of times that, oh, you chose this white knuckle and do what you got to do. That's babies for you. What did you think this was going to be easy? Those are the kinds of things that people are saying to new parents. And that's not helpful. When we have social, healthy social support, and so when we talk about a wellness plan and we plan for the postpartum, who's your, social, who's your emotional support? I, and people say, well, my, you know, my mother, my mother-in-law is coming, and I'll be like, are those healthy sports? Like, let's find the people who are really going to nurture and love on you. Because there's a saying that the new mother needs to be mothered. We talk so much about focusing on the baby, but we need to focus on what the parent is going through. And then perfectionism and high expectations. Usually people think perfectionism as I have to have everything in place and everything has to be orderly. What I'm talking about here is that perfectionism being the, I expect myself to be perfect. I expect to be all, do all, and do it all well, and do it all with a smile on my face. And when the baby sleeps, I'm gonna get the whole house cleaned, and I'm gonna make dinner, and I'm gonna take care of other people, and I'm gonna work, and I'm gonna do this. I worked with a mom once who was having twins, and she was thinking, I'm just gonna take about three weeks off, my partner is going to be taking off about a week, and they work from home, so um, if I need help, I'll be help, but I can handle it. And that's really hard. Those are some really high expectations. And, we, and the reality is, is nobody can do this alone. We need help, and it's okay to need help. So as I said, it's um, one of the perinatal mood and anxiety disorders are the most underdiagnosed and undertreated. Of all cases, we have about 40% are detected or diagnosed and diagnosed. And of those, only 60% receive any kind of treatment. And we know that the untreated illness has multi-generational effects. We know it affects the parents, it affects the, the partnership, it affects the children. And in, in 2017, ACOG did a consensus bun, bundle on maternal mental health. And what they found in, in that time is that an estimated $14.2 billion um, was, was needed to address all the consequences of the untreated care. We have to just keep in mind, think about that for a moment. We know that untreated maternal mental health is a direct link to future cognitive, behavioral, and emotional development of the baby. We also know that there's an increased risk of, of, of child abuse with untreated mental health issues. There's an increased risk of um, unfavorable parenting practices. Um, because that filter is really thin. And so when you see that mom at the Target screaming at her toddler and the baby is crying in the carrier and you're all, oh my goodness, I would never do that. Think about that for a moment. That's maybe, a, that's a mom that's likely struggling with some anxiety or depression. That's what's happening there. And she's likely untreated. And so we go, we, we judge it. And that's a lot of times why parents don't talk about it because we get the, oh my gosh. So I'm that person in Target when the mom is, you know, screaming and yelling, I go up to them and I say, you know what, you're doing a really good job, this is really hard. And then they look at me like I have two heads. Or and I'll say, do you want some help? And they also look at me like two heads because they're like, are they gonna, she's gonna take my baby or something. But no, I just, you know, I'm like, I'm just like, you're doing okay, you're, you know, you're good. But we have to make sure that that's, that's the reason. Part of it is that why, why people aren't um, reaching out is because we have this judgment that this is supposed to be all pink clouds and butterflies. And if I have a problem or I'm struggling in my mood, it must have to do with my baby. and has nothing to do with the baby. 
So what we tend to see is relationship problems. We know that the first year postpartum has one of the highest divorce rates in any time in a marriage. We know that there's poor, poor adherence to medical care, so exacerbation of other medical conditions. Um, we know that there's an increased risk of um, violence and separation, loss of interpersonal and financial resources. I can't tell you the number of people who suffer for even a year postpartum, and then they come to us and they're on short-term disability and their relationships are suffering because everyone's been white-knuckling it for a year. Um, we know that there's an increased risk of neglect and abuse, developmental delays and behavioral problems, increased use of tobacco and alcohol and drug use. Here's the thing, we joke about it. I got mommy's sippy cup. Oh, I need a drink. It's 2 o'clock. It's 5 o'clock somewhere. We, we minimize it, but um, oftentimes parents will, and we saw this in, in the pandemic as well, an increase in, in substance use, especially around alcohol. And then infanticide, suicide, and homicide are also risks of the untreated illness. So what do perinatal mood disorders look like? I want to take, a, take you kind of through that so you can you can get a glimpse about what that looks like. So the baby blues, we hear the baby blues all the time. And this is one of my favorite um, cartoons. You know, we, we're like three day, or day in at the hospital, you're going home, here you go, and we're both like, okay, now what? What do we do, what do we do? Um, but the baby blues, oftentimes people will say to me, gosh, I had the blues. And I'll say, how long did it last? And they'll say, about four months. And I'm like, that's not the blues. The blues is something that happens to a lot of women, people. Um, 50 to 80% of birthing individuals will experience that. It's usually within the first few weeks. It peaks um, around three days three to five. And it's really that roller coaster of emotions that occurs when we deliver after um, you might experience tearfulness and mood swings, feeling overwhelmed. It's one of those moments in those, those first few weeks, especially day three or five when that hormone drop is happening, where you're going, oh my gosh, what have I done? What have I done? And then you feel guilty about thinking that. Um, you're uncertain about things. You have anxiety and you may be forgetful. But it is not, it is not a mild form of depression at all. And it, because it differs in the timing and severity. So the depression will last longer than that and it will be a, a lot more severe. So depression, we, have, we see it about 20%. And you can have the persistence and um, sadness and crying like we think about depression. But what people don't realize is you can have an irritable depression. So I might not be in my bed with the covers over my head crying but I might be up organizing everything, and if you get in my way, I might lash out and scratch your eyes out. Or if you don't put that you know, cup where I think it belongs, you're gonna hear about it. So I might be very jumpy and irritable and, and lack of patience. And what I hear from parents is I have like a fog over my head, or I feel like I've lost myself, or um, I feel like I'm in a pit and I just can't get out and I feel like this is just how it's always going to be. And I don't know, I, don't, I just don't know what to do. I feel hopeless in this. I, I didn't think this is what it would be like. And so um, we will also see some physical symptoms. So we might feel, oh, I'm just achy. I have pains. I, um, I, I, don't, I don't feel like myself physically either. We might see ap appetite and, um, and sleep changes. Oftentimes, we'll see a lot of just um, on my phone, distraction behavior. So I'm like just laser focused on my phone and, and, and disconnecting, right? Um, we show this video sometimes about couples when I do my three-day training. And there's this mom, and she's literally just kind of zoning out. The bottle is in the baby's head, and she's just kind of like this, not even connecting. And so we know that untreated illness can impact the attachment with the baby. And that in itself has long-term effects. So we always also have to assess for suicidal thoughts. Anxiety um, can also happen about, about equal as depression, about 20%. We see a lot of anxiety in our practice. Um, and you can have it with or without panic. 
And these are the parents who are researching everything. How to be a good mom. And they have like 16 different answers of how to be the best mom you can be. And they try every single one of them. And it's not happening, it's not the equation that they were hoping. And so that freaks them out. And they're worried about everything. Well, what about this? Oh, and I fear this. Is the baby breathing? One mom, I was at a mom's group this week and was sharing about this. And she was like, yeah, I, I would sleep with my hand over my baby's belly to make sure my baby was breathing. Because um, what if they stop breathing? So are they, are they why am I always checking is what I'll hear with anxiety. Um, these are the moms that can't sit still. They can't shut their brain off. They're constantly fidgeting, maybe picking at their skin, um, like are their fingernails and things like that. They're the ones who think, oh my gosh, I have to get this swaddle right because if I don't get this right, they can go down the whole chapters in the books and take their kid to living under a bridge when they're an adult because I didn't do this right. And that's how fast it goes. They can have physical symptoms of anxiety, stomach issues, heart racing, tension in their neck, headaches. And if you, have, um, if you have panic, it can actually wake you up from a dead sleep. And panic is, you know, that heat rising, heart racing, sweating, and you have these fears that I'm dying, I'm going crazy, or I'm losing control. And so a lot of parents with anxiety will say, what if I lose control? What if I suddenly snap at some point? What if I'm like those people on TV that we hear about on the news who hurt their kids? What, and what if, I, what if suddenly I do that? That's anxiety, because they can see fear in everything that they're doing. If you have a history of high anxiety or history of panic, you're at risk for anxiety and panic in the perinatal period. You're also at risk for OCD. OCD in the perinatal period is very interesting. Now, when you think about it, OCD, you think about probably germs and washing hands, right? So I touch something, I have germs, I have germs, I have germs, that's the obsession. And the compulsion then is washing hands. And yes, that can happen in the perinatal period, especially if you have a history of OCD prior to pregnancy. Um, so perinatal women are at greater risk, 1.5 to 2 times greater risk for OCD onset than the general population. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and a large percentage of, of people with um, perinatal OCD will have comorbid depression because they're not talking about it. Because the other way it presents is with these intrusive, repetitive thoughts, usually around harm coming to the baby or their family. They're horrified by these thoughts. Anything can trigger these thoughts. And walking, you know, you know, we a lot of us have have intrusive thoughts. So we're carrying a baby and we're walking down the stairs, we think, oh gosh, what if I drop the baby? And that's an, that's, that's an intrusive thought, and that's a what if thought. Um, but a person with perinatal OCD, these thoughts are coming 20, 30, 40 times a day, and there anything can trigger it, walking by a balcony, cutting up vegetables, driving in a car, anything can trigger it, where we see it almost plays out like a movie in their head. They are in touch with reality. This is not psychosis. They know that these thoughts are wrong. They know that these, um, this, they, are in, they know that this is not right. They carry a, a lot of shame about these thoughts. Um, and usually they won't talk about it, but what they will do is everything in their power to ensure that that baby is safe. So checking, ordering, cleaning, um, having people around constantly. I had one woman um, come to me years ago. First she called at two months and she um, then canceled and then four months and then she canceled and then six months she finally came in. And I do my general education at the beginning and when I talked about OCD, she could just see her relax. And I said to her, because we don't just say, so are you having any OCD thoughts? We say, sometimes parents can have um, intrusive, scary thoughts to kind of freak you out. 
And, she, and people who are having those OCD thoughts will say, oh my gosh, yes. That's, yes, I'm having those. And those who are not will be like, oh, one time I was walking down the steps and I thought this. But this woman, she was having such intensive, intrusive thoughts for all this time, for many, many months. And she had shared something with her family and they were like, oh, don't tell anybody because your baby's going to get taken away. And here's the thing. Thoughts do not equal action. We all have intrusive thoughts. Let me just tell you this. When you're driving down the street and you see the bicyclist right here and you're driving along and you think, what if I went, you know you had it. You've had it or something like it. Doesn't mean we want to hurt that person. It just means that's an intrusive thought. And when we don't have OCD, we just keep driving. But if we have OCD, what happens is we think, did I, did I hit that person? Maybe I should go back and check and see if I did. And I actually had a client who did that. Like she had the same kind of thought and she kept going back and back and back and back. She even called the, the police department to make sure there was no hit and run. That's the compulsive behavior. So this client that came after six months and I shared everything and I saw the relief, at the end of the session she said, I thought for certain I was leaving here in a police car or an ambulance. That's the amount of shame that comes with perinatal OCD. And anything can trigger it, but it, they're anxious in nature. It is not delusional. And so if you ever come across someone who's having intrusive thoughts and it's a perinatal period and you're not sure, and you're like, oh my gosh, what if they're psychotic because that's what we hear about on the news? Find someone that actually knows perinatal mental health and get them assessed. So I'm gonna share some of the common fears. The other thing I should have said before I started, but I always get so excited to talk, is um, if any of this triggers anything for anybody, don't sit in it, come talk to me afterwards. You know, we can just ground you a little bit so that way you, know, you don't leave um, all worked up and everything. So some of the common OCD fears are a fear of acting on an unwanted urge to harm or kill the baby, a fear of acting in a sexually inappropriate manner to, to, with the baby, or the fear of doing something irresponsibly that would lead to the baby's death. So for example, I had one client who um, would, was always fearful that she would forget the baby, that she took the baby out of the car. So she'd go check and go check and go check the garage, make sure the baby wasn't in the car, make, make sure the baby wasn't in the car. Another client who, um, every time she changed the baby's diaper, was torture for her. And she, they're overcome with anxiety. It's horrifying for them. It's overwhelming. And the things we hear is, I have never had thoughts like this before, and I have them now, so what does that mean about me? Or what kind of mother has these thoughts? And so the shame that carry, that's why we see comorbid depression. And parents with perinatal OCD are not going to harm their children. They're at risk of harming themselves because they will likely have that depression with them because they're not going to talk about it. And they usually, it's prolonged. The experience is prolonged. So, um, perinatal, um, okay. It does not have anything to do with the baby. I know I'm just, I'm just upset. I'm just hit, beating a, a, dead, a dead horse here or whatever the saying is because it's really important because I've worked with many women um, who well-meaning providers have caused more harm because they didn't understand perinatal OCD. And so the, just keep in mind, the thought is obsessive in nature. Thoughts don't equal action. And parents, are ang they are in touch with reality. That's all you just need to know there. So you can also have perinatal PTSD. Um, so we know that about one to six percent of women experience PTSD following the birth, but up to twenty-four, but up to thirty-four um, percent report an, a traumatic birth. We also know that about twelve percent of women in the general population experience PTSD. It can be triggered by a real or perceived trauma. So um, like a birth trauma, so an actual or threatened injury to the, um, of death or, in, or injury. So it could be a C-section, prolapse cord, forceps, a vacuum, um, any other complications. Or it can come, at, come up as a result of previous trauma, so previous sexual trauma or physical trauma. So here's what we know about trauma. When we go through a traumatic event, we disconnect from our head and our heart to survive it. It's a natural thing that we do to survive. Some people will say it's like I was outside my body, right? 
Because if we thought through something and felt it at the same time as it was happening, we would lose our mind. So it's a natural coping, like it's protective. So what ends up happening though, most of us do, is okay, that's over, now I can go on. And um, that NICU parents experience all the time. Oh, you're, the baby's home now, aren't you so happy? Now you can breathe and you can move on. But all of that trauma stays with us and we hold it in our body. There's a great book called The Body Keeps the Score. And it talks about how, where we hold trauma in our body. And then when we have trauma, a sight, a sound, a body sensation, a smell can trigger that trauma and we can re-experience the symptoms as if it's happening all over again. So what we tend to see with people who have tra trauma histories is we can see flashbacks. And it's not like in the movies where you see the flashback and they're like, oh my gosh. It might be just replaying that event over and thinking about it over and over and over again. Or you might have nightmares or you might have hypervigilance, which that hypervigilance is like a scared cat ready to pounce, I'm on alert all the time. I worked with one woman who had childhood trauma and she would share about like when she was in high school, when she, would, her, she had a, an, a, an abusive parent and she would hear something on the other side of the house and literally jump out of bed at, in her sleep. Like she'd be uh, hypervigilant even in her sleep. Okay, so that's, that's a symptom of trauma. Anger is a symptom of trauma or numbness or disconnecting ourselves from from the other, from anyone around us. So you think about someone who's had sexual trauma, for example. When you find out you're pregnant, you go in for an ultrasound, sometimes they do an internal ultrasound. I've had many a women, woman um, have flashbacks or have re-experienced their, tra their sexual trauma on that table. And they, they don't know what's happening and they freak out. Why am I thinking about this now? This is supposed to be a happy time. Why is this coming up now? I dealt with that a long time ago, the things I hear. Or when you have a baby that has had, um, or when you had a, a, a delivery that's had interventions or complications, what we often see is avoidance of the follow-up care because they remind you of the trauma. So we do whatever we can to forget it. Parents in the NICU, when they go home, they have lots of people that want to come and see that baby. And different interventions, but they will, what they'll do is sometimes not show or not answer the door when those people come. And then you know what we hear is, oh, they're non-compliant, they're non-compliant, they're non-compliant, they're non-compliant. My question is, are they traumatized? Because we know that NICU parents have a high rate of PTSD symptoms. Even in the NICU, we used to do a bed, bedside support in, in one of the NICUs in one of the big hospitals, and I would hear from the team a lot of the times, well, you know, this mom is not coming and she's just being neglectful and she's, you know, we've told her she needs to do this, this, and this, and this. And I'll, I'll learn more about the, like, tell me about the delivery. She might have a 24-weeker. And I'll be like, is it possible she's traumatized and not just a bad parent? So we always have to remember to see the individual in front of us. What's their story? What, bring, what, what do they bring with them into their parenting? Because what we, we bring so much into our parenting and all of it can come to the surface because it's a vulnerable time. So bipolar disorder, I, we talk about bipolar disorder because you can have these periods of depression and euphoria, little need for sleep, um, high energy. But we know that a previous bipolar diagnosis it, um, um, puts a parent at high risk for postpartum psychosis. But we also know that this is a time where many people might experience their first bipolar mania because it's this massive stressor on the body and, um, and all of a sudden they're experiencing something that they've never experienced before. We have bipolar, we call bipolar two the PPD imposter because what ends up tend to happen is the, the client will present as depressed and then she'll go to her OB who will give her an antidepressant and then we'll see a hypomania. So we want to get a really good history 
Oftentimes, um, this is the first time that some people are diagnosed with bipolar illness. Um, and we wanna know those people with bipolar disorder prior to pregnancy or when they get pregnant, they want to, we want them to stay on their medication. Lots of great, there's lots of psychiatric providers that specialize in maternal mental health that keep people on their medication and it's okay. And there's research to support that. The reason we want someone with bipolar disorder to be on their meds and be connected if they have a previous diagnosis is because they are at high risk for psychosis. And psychosis, is rare. It happens in one to two about of every birth, of every thousand births. We usually see it within the first few weeks to two to three weeks postpartum or that first month. And it's, this is a medical emergency because there's a 5% suicide rate and a 4% infanticide rate. This is what you're hearing about on the news. So when you hear about that mom who took her life and took her baby's life and they call it postpartum depression, it drives me bonkers because it's not depression, it's psychosis usually. And what they're experiencing is delusions or false beliefs about the, about the baby. They're paranoid. Um, they're maybe seeing and hearing things. Or they're having hallucinations that seeing, hearing things that nobody else is seeing or hearing. They may be very confused or disoriented or disorganized. They are also um, struggling with sleep. So when we've had tragedies here in Arizona, um, those moms, if you ask, how much sleep did you get in a 24-hour period? They'll say, oh, maybe two to four hours of sleep. And that is not okay. <laughs> so we joke about sleep deprivation, but we want to help parents sleep because it, their sleep and the mood go hand in hand. And so the other thing we see with psychosis is that it also can wax and wane. But there's something that can be that um, we just need to understand, we just need to spend time. That's why seeing the individual in front of you is so important. So I've had it in our office presented as complete catatonia. I had one time um, a, a mom come in who wanted to see my ID, wanted to see my license to practice, and then proceeded to rearrange my entire office as we talked. So I didn't freak out by it. I just let her do what I do. I mean, like I was in the chair and everything else was being moved around. But as she was doing that, I was gathering a lot of information. And so I asked her, you know, she was telling me she was having a hard time sleeping. And I said, well, tell me, what, well, what do you do at night when you're, when you're sleeping? Do you do this? And she's like, well, I did it first, um, but now I've rearranged everything. So I, I, watch, I watch this certain show. And um, then she said, well, um, I said, well, tell me about it. And she's like, well, this character, just speaking directly to me. I'm like, okay, what is it saying? And so then we went into that. And I wasn't reacting, I wasn't freaking out. And so she, the more I was able to hear her and sit with her and talk to her, she was telling more, me more and more about her, what, it, what her world was like. And so then we could get her the help she needed. But this is rare. Psychosis is rare. We see depression and anxiety and OCD and um, panic and PTSD. We see PTSD a lot. Um, this is rare. So in the 20-something years I've been working with perinatal families, I've seen psychosis probably four times, just to give you perspective. So, um, but we do see a lot of, we see a lot of PTSD. Like I said, all of my therapists are EMDR trained, which is uh, best one of the best practice for trauma treatment. So for prevention, women with bipolar disorder, as I mentioned, should stay on their medication throughout their pregnancy. Um, we ideally want to treat people for everyone, really, in if they have a history of any kind in pregnancy and through the postpartum. We want to keep, um, create a postpartum wellness plan. Sleep is essential. So sometimes if a woman has a history of bipolar illness, we need to come up with a plan about how we're going to protect the sleep. And that might mean some decisions about, are we supplementing, are we, because we have to weigh the cost benefit of the risk to the mood and the risk of psychosis versus sleep and medication and all of the things and what the parent wants. And then practical support is really important. So there's some other considerations I want to address as well. Many of you probably have heard about postpartum rage. Lots of people are talking about it. Um, and it's really this struggle to control the temper. This is the mom that's screaming at her kid in the Target or in the fries. Um, 
They're screaming and they're swearing, maybe throwing things. Um, they have like these violent thoughts and urges. They don't want to hurt them. They're just filled with rage and anger. And they feel horrible about it. They feel shameful and they have a lot of guilt about their behavior. They're not able to snap out of it. Um, and they feel horrific. I mean, let me just tell you the shame that these parents experience. Like the, someone will, will describe, like, I was so angry. I was clenching my teeth. I thought I was going to break my tooth. This is a symptom of a perinatal mood and anxiety disorder. So let's not judge that mom or that dad. Let's say, hey, let me get some help for you. This is a symptom of it. So we want to make sure postpartum rage is not because you're a jerk or you're not a nice person. It's a symptom of what else is going on and we can treat it. Because here's the thing, perinatal mood disorders are, are treatable. That's the beautiful thing. There's another issue that can occur called dysphoric milk ejection reflex or DEMER. And I share this because it, um, it, some people will experience when they have an, the letdown of their milk, they have this overwhelming feeling of depression and dysphoria, sadness and this heaviness. And then it goes away, but then they have anxiety about the next time they're going to the nurse. And so this is something that can happen. We just, and when they talk about it with someone, you can say, oh yeah, this is what it is. They're like, oh, I thought I was going crazy. I was so afraid I was going to lose my mind. And, I'm, and, and so this is something that can occur for some breastfeeding parents. As I mentioned, we can have it, we can experience perinatal mood disorders in dads. And I want to share this quick video with you guys about this. And this is one of my favorite videos to share with people. You want to go first? Uh, and, and the foot side. You want to go on that side? So we'll go over here so we can walk up? Yeah. Okay. Dad will walk up. Dad will walk up with you, yes. I was excited to be a father. Um, we got lucky and we got pregnant on the first try and then we found out we were having a boy. Uh, I was very, very excited. And everything seemed fine. You know, my, we, the pregnancy went well. And then, you know, we came on time. And I'd say probably within the first, while we were in the hospital, I started to get very anxious. It's taken a long time for us to recognize postpartum depression in women, and it's going to take longer for us to really accept that strong men can also get postpartum depression or anxiety. Go! Go! <laughs> Good job. When I would get home, and my wife would give him to me, I would get, you know, he would just start crying and I would just hand him right back and say, I don't want him. And by about week four or five, I started to say some very mean things and very hurtful things about him to my wife, just saying that there was something wrong with him and that he was, that he was just gonna be the end of our relationship and the end of our lives. Whoa! <laughs> Big, huge study came out in 2006, and many since then, that recognized in this study of 5,000 men that one in 10 men also get postpartum depression or anxiety. It looks a little different in men. They tend to check out, play video games, hide in their man cave, irritable, angry, um, this initial high, and then they kind of crash. The dark thoughts that I had in general were of the homicidal, suicidal variety. Um, and they were very vivid, and I, I can remember them. I mean, I, I try very hard not to think about them, but I, I remember what they were. I, I could see it very clearly. Dads feel a tremendous amount of stress, and we have to recognize that. So many years, dads have been kind of relegated to the sidelines as the support person without our recognizing that they're having an emotional experience of becoming a father as well. You know, one thing that I've learned is that there's a, there's a big difference between thinking something and doing something. And a very wise doctor told me that you're entitled to thoughts, and thoughts are not actions. That's how you work through things. That's how you realize things about yourself. All right, big boy, ready? One more big swing. Right. If you think about fathers, societally, in America, men are supposed to be breadwinners. We're supposed to be the rocks for our wives. We're the men. And being a man is not usually associated with having doubts about being a father 
or crying or weakness. So it makes it doubly hard, I think, for men in America to talk about this even with their own spouses. We'll go back so we can swing ourselves. Uh, you know, he's two years old now and the way that I kind of felt those first few months, just there's, it's so far in the background now that I can't even, I can't even like, I can't imagine why I felt that way when that happened because I see him now and so much of my worry and anxiety was that he wouldn't be like this when he was two. And so now I feel like, especially given what I do for a living in pediatrics, I know that I'm very lucky and I know that I have, you know, that whether by just... Me, Mama go. Mama's on the other side. That whether just by, you know, good genetics or just the way we've raised them or what, but I tell everybody, I'm like, I, I have the, I have no, the kid no, I, I no, needed to no, have. No more. No more? Yeah. You don't want to, you don't want to swing anymore? No. Okay. I'll just let it stop. He's a good kid. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So Dr. Levine is a hey, Yale-educated Yale pediatrician. Would you expect that a pediatrician would understand what the perinatal mood and anxiety disorder is? We assume that, people, that our pediatrician, our OB, our midwife will know that this can happen, but even he didn't know this could happen. And as you heard, he was having intrusive thoughts, right? And he didn't understand what was happening for him. So I love that video because we also have to recognize that fathers, can um, they also have a, a hormone shift that happens because with with stress we have shifts in our hormones and in our chemistry and they have their own experience again because like that system take model we also have to talk about maternal mortality um, because we know this was data from 2018 actually the cdc just released the national data for 2020 which indicated 23.8 deaths per every 100,000. Um, a majority, a, a large percentage of those deaths were a result of mental health and substance use. We also know about 80% of those deaths um, were um, preventable. We also know that black and brown moms are dying at a higher rate. The, 2020, or the 2020 data also indicated that black moms are dying about three times more than white moms. Um, so there were health disparities as well. And so we have to help um, we have to change that. It's not okay. We have to do something different to have our parents be heard. You can also have a, what we call a maternal near miss. A maternal near miss is an event where an individual nearly dies due to their pregnancy or childbirth complication. They're often unexpected and leave the survivor alone and traumatized. Um, a near miss, um, I've worked with many clients who have experienced like a hemorrhage, weren't heard, um, they, they said something's not right with my body and were ignored or overlooked. Um, then they have a hemorrhage and they end up in the, the ICU. And then again, like most crises, we, what we do is we say, okay, it's done, move on, move on, you're better now, you're okay. And so we have to not overlook those parents because many of those parents are carrying a lot of trauma. I worked with one mom who was a nurse who experienced a hemorrhage and um, during COVID and as um, she could, as she was sort of blacking out, she could hear what was being said and she knew exactly what was happening to her. And then when they went into IR, interventional radio, um, the, the room to try and help stop the bleeding. She could also hear everything that they were saying, which was also traumatizing to her. And so um, that sat with her for a long time, but she was just so excited because she spent 10 days in the NICU or in the ICU. She was so excited to get home and be with her baby because she lost, she felt like she had lost so much time that she just kind of pushed those, si those things aside until she started having nightmares and she became overwhelmed and having panic. And so then that's when she came in about four months postpartum and said, I'm not sure why this is happening. I'm fine now. And that's that trauma that stayed with her. So a new, maternal near miss, what we've seen is that a lot, um, just with, that, with the workforce shortages 
and the results of the pandemic on the medical community, we're seeing more and more of those complications. So best practice treatment, like I said, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders are 100% treatable. People get well. Um, he, you saw it with that dad, he got well. Um, so cognitive behavioral therapy, individual and group therapy, best practice, interpersonal therapy, looking at how the, um, the, how the, the system is changing, peer support groups or telephone support, um, and psychoeducational groups and mother-infant therapy education are all best practices. So um, really exciting stuff is that Postpartum Support International and HRSA have partnered to create a 24-7 um, maternal mental health hotline that's actually manned by clinicians. So up until this last year, we've had a warm line. We had a warm line in the state and then a national warm line where you call and leave a message and then somebody gets back to you. Now it's an actual hotline, so that's exciting. To reach us, you can go to our website to intake um, at WHI Arizona. Postpartum Support International is an, is an amazing organization. Um, every, every area has a, a state coordinator or country coordinator because it's internationally known, um, and they know the landscape. So if you need to get referrals for someone in New York, you can call, look on the website and look for that area in New York to that area coordinator, and that's really wonderful. And then Air, Postpartum Support International has an Arizona chapter that um, to advocate and support moms in the state, and I highly recommend them as well. This was outside there um, as well, but we offer a lot of different groups to support parents. Many of them are free. Um, we partner with various organizations like Dignity Healthcare, Hope Women's Center. Hope Women's Center, we provide a Spanish-speaking parenting group, a Spanish-speaking um, postpartum support group, and something called the ROSE program, which is actually a prevention program for postpartum depression for low-income women. We also provide a father's group and a, po a right general postpartum support group and a few therapy groups around loss. And we also do DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, which helps you um, really regulate your emotions. I think everybody should take DBT. So that is the end of my um, presentation. Does anybody have any questions? I know it's late. Everyone's like, I'm tired. But any questions or reactions? Just yell them out if you have them. I really appreciate, oh, yes? Um, so I've heard some mothers reject their babies after having them. What would you like to answer to why they do that? Yeah, probably a perinatal mood disorder. So sometimes you can, with depression, um, they'll, just, they'll just disconnect um, um, from their, their baby. The other thing is, is if they're having intrusive thoughts, some parents will have someone else try to take care of them because they want to keep themselves safe. So a perinatal mood disorder is typically why they will move, move away from their babies or reject their babies, as they say. So again, get it treated. Yes? Sure, so estrogen and progesterone increase throughout the pregnancy, and I don't know the exact number, but just like I said earlier, it was like equivalent to 100 birth control pills. And then day three, it's like going to none. So you have to have the decrease in estrogen because you, to be able to have milk production. So that, milk, that estrogen level stays low, and so, um, but the percentages, I don't know, because I'm not a physician, but. But it is like going from 100, the doctors I spoke to, 100 birth control pills to none. That's huge. I can't even tell you how big that is. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I don't have that exact number, though. Thank you. That's a good question, actually. I'm going to look up. Yes? On the best practices for treatment, I didn't see medication, and I'm curious if yeah. it's something that you have found that the, the therapy options are better than Sure. We do like a stepped-up care. Right, so um, some, some people can, they just need social support, right? And they can go to a support group or have some other people around them and that works. Or therapy is the next thing, right? And if that doesn't work, then yes, medication is, is um, acceptable. And we work very closely with a 
a psychiatric NP here in the, in the Valley who specializes in maternal mental health. The thing we do know is if you're, they're gonna take medication, best practice is, is therapy with it. Oftentimes people will just take medication and not really do the therapy part of it and it's really best practices to do both together if you do a medication. Thank you for that. Yes? Um, a lot of these are what you do after a woman already has perinatal depression. Mm -hmm. What should someone do when they're trying to prevent? That is a great question. So I think if they, if they know they have a history or a family history or if they're at risk of some reason, um, getting into therapy in pregnancy is huge because then they can work on a postpartum plan. What we also know, though, is practical support. So um, I, I, I had one dad who said when people came over, he had a list of jobs to do, <laughs> throw in the laundry, do the dishes, and someone you had to pick a thing to do before you could hold the baby. And I was like, that is brilliant. Because the thing is, is that we know practical support is helpful. We know social support is helpful. We know emotional support is helpful. So how can we, be, we build that plan during the pregnancy so that, um, and, and address like expectations and things like that in pregnancy so that there's, a, there's an ease into the postpartum period. We know who we're gonna call if we need the house cleaned. We know we're gonna, who we're gonna call if we need a meal. We know who we're gonna call if we need a babysitter or if we have um, nursing challenges. We have all the systems in place. And so we can set up, um, and if we have a history of, or say we have a person who has um, depression or anxiety in pregnancy, we might work with a prescriber and sometimes People don't want to take medicine in pregnancy, so then we set up a plan to start medicine right after delivery, or get in with that prescriber, you know, week at one week out. So we come up with a plan that works specifically for that person, depending on what their history is, what their family history is. So we take a really good history to understand what we might be dealing with, and then we can come up with a plan with them. So getting in during pregnancy, ideal. I tell all my family members who have depression or anxiety, I'm all listen, but when you get pregnant, and some of them are like, I'm not even thinking about that. You gotta get into therapy and plan your postpartum. <laughs> and they really literally look at me like I'm crazy because, but it's so important because if you can do that with someone who specializes in this, we can come up with a beautiful plan. So it's kind of like, it really is planning for the parenting piece instead of just, what most people do is plan for the birth. That answer your question. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Well, it's not really a, a question. I just have like a reaction. Sure. Um, I worked in pediatrics for about three years, and um, when you were mentioning like, oh, the judgments that typically come from other people, I was so like it. It pierced my heart because I just started tearing up, oh. and I was like, I'm so sorry to these parents, to these mothers that I judged for missing all of their baby's appointments. It's just, it, it really struck my heart. Mm. So, um, yeah, that's my question. Thank you for sharing that. And I would say be kind to yourself because we don't know what we don't know. And so now you know, right? And so it'll be a different experience the next time you see a mom, right? So be kind to yourself. But I I'm, thank you for sharing that with us. I appreciate that. Because we all do it, though, also, also, we all judge. We all do it. And if you say you don't, you're lying. We all do it. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? All righty. Well, again, thank you so much for having me. If you have any questions, you can feel free to email my office, and they'll, they always send me. They'll, they'll send it off to me or call my office. I'm happy to answer any questions. If you or someone you know is experiencing this, please don't sit in it. Um, talk to someone who knows perinatal mental health. Um, you, just remember, the universal message of Postpartum Support International is you are not alone, you did not cause this, and with proper care, you will be well. And that's what you can share with any perinatal family. Thank you so much, everyone.